My name is Father Dennis Dorner. I am a relatively young priest for the Archdiocese of Atlanta. I've been ordained for three years. I'm a new chaplain down at Our Lady of Mercy, which is down in Fayetteville, Georgia. And um, I'll talk to you guys about the Mass today. And as I was putting this class together, I was trying to think of how, how do you how do you collapse the Mass into one hour? Some priests can't even get the Mass celebrated. <laughs> so how can I actually explain it to you all within that time? So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to go through the various parts of the Mass, because everybody's coming from a very different educational level as well. And so we're kind of going to do like a drive-by as far as talking about the different parts of the Mass. But then I want us to focus in specifically talking about the Our Father itself. Because really, the Our Father, the Our Father is that Our Father in And any time we are engaging in prayer itself, it's to be modeled after the Lord's Prayer, or after that prayer of discipleship. And so we're going to kind of go go on through, and then I'll kind of stop for a second, and we're going to zoom in, and then we'll zoom back out and keep on going. Sound good? All right. We're going to go ahead and get in prayer, though, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we ask that you open our hearts so that we can be aware of your presence within our lives. We ask that you uh, focus our attention so that we may grow more close in relationship with you and with our brothers and sisters. We ask this all through Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the, name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So we're used to the Mass itself, right? I mean, hopefully we're getting there every week, and that's a good thing. It's an important thing. But, you know, I want us to kind of focus on also, how are we guiding those who we educate in that understanding of the liturgy itself? My first assignment, I want to make sure nobody's in here that I would know. Okay. So my first assignment, I had a school that was at the, assign or at the, at the church that I worked at. And it was funny, when we had uh, school liturgies, and this was the kindergarten through eighth grade, and there was one teacher who was there, and if the kids weren't perfect, if the kids walked up and let's say they put their hand like out like this to receive the Eucharist, or maybe they just weren't in that state of mind at that very second, especially when they're middle schoolers, like middle schoolers are mutants anyways. So like the reality is, why are we expecting this perfect thing? But the way that she would correct them, and she, she would say, you're Catholic, you know better than that. And I used to say, how would they know better than that necessarily because they're Catholic? The only way that they're going to actually understand the stuff is if we guide them through this relationship. And you need to do so in a loving way. Because our faith is not a series of rules. Our faith is a relationship. Now, there are rules within that relationship, right? Just like any other relationship that we have in our life. You know, I've got certain friends that there are certain topics that we just don't talk about. That's a rule that we have in our relationship, and it allows us to be better friends because we don't talk about those things. Or if you are in a, let's say, a marriage itself, right? There are rules within that relationship, right? and you know what those rules are, and they're not universal for every marriage, but you know what those are. This is so that we can stay in the right way within our relationship, and we need to be able to do that. As a Catholic people, we have these rules to guide us in that relationship. But our faith is not a series of if-then statements. St. Peter's not standing there at the gates going, yeah, you did this, but you didn't do this. It's about the relationship that we have with our God. And the Mass is that perfect way of, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I'd probably trip on it eventually. The Mass is that perfect way of guiding us through growing in relationship, not only with God the Father, but also with all of our brothers and sisters who are there with us. And we need to be ever so very mindful of that all the time. You know, there's this phrase, um, you know, you go to be a Trappist monk not to get away from everyone else, but rather to grow closer with your brothers. And that's a, a really interesting thing, because people don't think about that. They think, well, I'm going away to the monastery because I want to lock away the world. <laughs> no, you're putting yourself in a pressure cooker. There's a reason the Trappists only use sign language, or used to only use sign language for the most part. It's to keep them in right relationships, so they didn't talk about the things that don't matter. They talked about the things that did matter. And that's a, a fascinating thing, because you know, even Thomas Merton talks about this in Seven Story Mountain. He said, it's funny, even taking a vow of silence, there are those people who just, their chewing is annoying. You know? And so this is just the nature of human behavior that we all have, that people are going to drive us nuts, but we don't escape. You cannot run from people. We need to learn to love people. And the way that we do that is through the Mass. The way that we do that is through prayer. 
So often in prayer, though, people treat it as if it's kind of like a, you know, uh, this, let's say it's like throwing a coin into a fountain or perhaps it's, you know, making a wish upon a star. Really, it's more like a lobbyist bugging a politician is how a lot of people treat prayer. If I pray long enough, if I bug God enough, maybe God will change his mind. That's not how it works. You know, he's God, we're not, and you can't change the mind of God. That's a very hard thing for people to wrap their mind around. But he's the divine, and well, we are the people that he created. You can't change God's mind. And pastoring him means that we're actually automatically looking as though I can manipulate my God. And you can't manipulate your God. You can't change his mind. You can't do any of that. Prayer, and when we engage in prayer, is all about changing us. It's about changing our hearts. It's about learning to be more loving in spite of, not because of. And so we need to be aware of the fact that prayer itself is engaging in that relationship, diving deep so that we can love more, so that we can be more accepting of things. Anytime we ever pray for somebody, it's so that I feel more united with them. That's what the Christian community is about. If there's somebody who's being persecuted in Bolivia and the tears are running down their cheeks, we should be so closely united in prayer that you can feel those tears and you feel like you need to wipe them off yourself. That's what prayer does to us. It pulls us together. It changes our hearts. And it makes us more whole as a Christian people. Prayer itself is a fascinating thing. You know, um, so let's take you back to the time of Christ. No people had a higher ideal of prayer than the Jews at the time of Christ. Like, as far as an organized people who prayed, at the time of Jesus, the Jews were all about some prayer. And they did it. And they did it fervently. And they had specific, I don't know, prescriptions of prayer that they did each and every day. Great is prayer, said the rabbis, greater than all good works. Praying is more important than changing the world in, in that mindset at that point in time. And so prayer was something integral to the life of the believer. Anytime you were engaging in prayer, recognizing the relationship that we have with God the Father is a good thing. He who prays within his house surrounds it with a wall that is stronger than iron. It's an amazing thing. It's, it's really looking at prayer as protection that guides us. It's prayer that, that keeps us together as a family and keeps us safe as a family. And also, let's take back to the time of Christ. How important was family? Family was everything. You know, and so this is what keeps your family together. This is what keeps family whole. Uh, the only re regret of the rabbis was that you couldn't possibly pray all day long. You had to go live, right? You had to go do things. You couldn't stop and pray all the time. And that's the regret of that faithful person at that point in time. But it's fascinating how faults tend to creep in. Familiarity breeds contempt. And even at the time of Christ, there was this whole issue that was taking place um, of just prayer had become very rote. Prayer had become very routine. Prayer was one of those things that people, they just did it to do it. Sound familiar? We do this very much with our Catholic faith a lot of times. You know, the liturgy of the hours, it's, um, it's something I've learned to love as being a priest. I've been praying it for, what, 12 years now, since before seminary. And I'm not going to say I, I enjoy praying the liturgy of the hours, but there was a time where it became very much too routine for me. And it was not a fruitful engagement with God the Father. It wasn't something that was making me grow in relationship. Actually, it was making me struggle more than anything else because I was just going through the motions. And so I had to realize that I needed to do something different. This is when I started lighting incense when I would do it. I tried to engage the other senses. I would light a match so that I had a focal point in those moments of silence in between. But you have to do something in your prayer to change it up. Otherwise, it becomes way too routine for us. It becomes something that doesn't necessarily help us grow. And that's what prayer is about, to grow, right? I mean, obviously, there's transformation that takes place. That's the whole point of the question is constant conversion. And conversion isn't a singular event. It's something that can happen thousands of times over a day. It just depends on how challenging the people are around you, perhaps, or how much you really want to grow in holiness. So um, it's important for us to note also that these, these prayers of, uh, or this, this tendency to become lackadaisical in our prayer, this only actually happens with somebody who's actually really committed to praying often. That doesn't happen for the people who really couldn't possibly care less. They just stop praying. It doesn't matter to them. This is somebody who thinks that prayer is something that, and while this is a very true thing, it should happen all the time. But when we're doing it just to do it, that's a problem. 
It's kind of like how we go to Mass on Sundays. Are we going to Mass because it's my Sunday obligation? Or am I going to Mass because it's an opportunity for grace? Very different way of looking at things, right? Because if I look at it as something that I have to do, then it's just another item on my checklist of things that have to get done this weekend. But if I look at it as the first thing that I start my week off with, that wellspring of grace that guides every other action throughout my week, one sounds far more appealing, doesn't it? One seems like something that's going to really help me be a better version of myself. And that's looking at it as an opportunity. Because let's face it, if you're, kicking, or if you're dragging your heels while you're, you're going into the church to, to you know, pray or to actually to get mass, let's face it, some people just go to mass to be at mass. I don't know that God's rejoicing in that. Because you're not seeking relationship, you're just in a building. And this is kind of like sleeping in a garage, it doesn't make you a car. Just showing up to mass doesn't make you a good Catholic. And so we need to really be engaging in that opportunity that we have for grace. You know, there were two things that were prescribed for every Jew at the time of Christ. Um, there was the Shema, which consists of three short uh, passages of scripture coming from Deuteronomy and Numbers. And so, like, this happened no matter what, every day for that individual. If you were a devout Jew, <coughs> you prayed that every day without fail. And the second one, um, or in that, that word Shema comes from the imperative, the Hebrew word, to hear. And so there's great irony that we're sitting there just spewing words three times a day, and no one's hearing anything. We're not reciprocating in that relationship. That's talking at God, not talking with God. Do we see the difference between those two things? Okay. I'm going to pretend that you guys all said yes. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing which every Jew had to do at that point in time was, um, was to repeat um, the Shemana es Ezra, which means... Um, the 18, and it was this series of 18 readings. It eventually became 19 readings that they did. You had to do these every day, but let's say you forgot those prayers, or let's say for some reason you weren't, you didn't have access to it, there was a loophole, and so you could pray like an alternative option, but people were doing it just to do it. This happened uh, before the Second Vatican Council with the Liturgy of the Hours. There was a dispensation that priests had if you were driving in the car during a particular time, you didn't have to pray your hours. And so I've heard about all kinds of priests. You know, I was formed up in Chicago. There were priests that would drive from Chicago to Milwaukee and back to Chicago just to get out of praying liturgy the hours. It's not that painful. They don't beat you with the book. So I don't understand why you would want to sit in a car for two hours. But that was one of those things that people were doing. They were looking for loopholes to get out of prayer. Mass shouldn't be like that. The liturgy of the hours, the prayer of the people shouldn't be like that. We shouldn't do something just to do it. We should do it because we're guided by love. We should do it because we, we hope for something. And that's where I really want us to focus on the Mass itself. Because prayer, can, prayer cannot and should not be rushed. Prayer needs to be deliberate. Prayer needs to be intentional. And so this is where we go into the Mass itself. We have the introductory rites of the Mass. It's where we begin, you know. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit, you're recognizing the, the spirit of God within me being a priest when I begin the Mass in that way. We begin that in that way also because it's kind of like a, hey guys, what's up? I want everything good for all of you. That's what the priest is saying in that very moment in the very beginning. It's a greeting from Paul. It's a Pauline greeting, essentially. And so we look to that to be, this is how we, we start off. This is how we begin. So these are the parts that precede the Liturgy of the Word, the entrance, song, the greeting, what all that potential right curia, all that stuff's going to happen. But this is that what's up that happens at the very beginning of the Mass itself. It's important for us to be aware of the fact that we are beginning that, and it can begin with either the priest, or if it's a liturgy of the word, it can begin with the deacon as well. We would say, and with your spirit of the deacon as well. Why is that? Well, he's an ordained minister for the church. He is a cleric. And I'm not a clericalist at all, especially if you guys know me. I wear, rarely ever wear my collar. But I think it's important for us to be aware of the fact that we need to recognize the deacons as a member of the clergy, and that they can guide us in worship. It doesn't always happen in every parish. In fact, there are parishes that have no deacons. That one blows my mind. But it's one of those things that we need to be aware of within the church, that it's a gift, and it's been around for a long time, and that we need to let those good, hardworking servants, and they are the table servants, they are the ones who tend to the table, we need to let them guide us in that. And that's a, a very important thing. <clears throat> All right, slow down this. All right, so 
They walk in, there's that veneration and greeting that takes place at the altar. Why do we kiss the altar? Why does the priest kiss the altar? Does anybody know that? The altar represents Christ. And so we go up to kiss that altar. Now, if you've ever had the opportunity to go to a dedication of a church, they take that altar and they slather the altar with sacred chrism. And it's a beautiful thing, and the whole place smells like balsam, and it's, it's, it smells like salvation. It's an incredible thing. And so we go up to that altar to begin to reverence Christ first and foremost. Anytime you ever see a lector, and they, this is a thing that drives me nuts about the church, if there's a tabernacle and there's an altar, you, you kind of pretend the tabernacle's not there. This is a teaching point that you can all share. Yes, Jesus is present in the tabernacle, but during the liturgy itself, the central focus isn't the tabernacle, the central focus is the altar itself. And so anytime a liturgical minister is coming forward, they would reverence the altar. Even if Jesus is back there hanging in the tabernacle, that's okay. He's still going to be there after Mass, so you can genuflect then if you want to. But we focus on the central point, which is the altar itself. And that's very important for us to be aware of. We then go in and we have the, the penitential rite. Now, there are some people who are on the, the, the left of the church, you know, and they will say, well, why do we always acknowledge our sins first? You know, why is it that you're always coming in and going, you know, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I don't know, because we keep sinning and sinning and sinning. That's why we keep saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And it's important, even within um, some of the greatest thinkers of the church, the nation God is, let's acknowledge sin first, so that we know what it is that we are praying for. So that we know what it is that we are trying to turn over to God and let him transform. Because once upon a time when eyes would gaze upon a cross, that would be an instrument of fear. Or it would instill fear within the hearts of all. But now we see a cross and we see hope. Where does that come from? Christ himself. And so we're looking for that transformation. Taking something that is a weakness and making it something that gives us strength. And so we are mindful in that moment. That's why we do the Kyrie at the beginning. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. We are seeking to be transformed. We are seeking conversion. Then what we do is that opening prayer. Now, obviously, there's a Gloria that takes place before that. We want to give glory to God. It's important to give glory to God. We never want to stop giving glory to God. In fact, the way that we live our life, in all ways, if we can grow to be the person that God's calling us to be, we give glory to God. But within the Mass itself, we acknowledge our sinful nature, and we give glory to God so that he can transform that sinful nature into strength, into triumph, into something that is worth celebrating. And that's, that's why that happens. It's not so that we stay in the state of gloom and doom the entire time, but rather it's so that we can have hope. Because you read the Old Testament, the whole theme is hope. We look for the resurrection, that's hope. Hope is the prevailing theme of our faith. And so it's all about hope and trust. Hope that, that God's going to take me and make me who I am going to be. But it also requires our cooperation, right? Because grace pours forth where the human will and the divine will cooperate. That's where that outpouring of grace happens. And so we need to cooperate with our God so that we can be the grace-filled people that we're called to be. Penitential right? Gloria. Opening prayer. We actually call it a collect. C-O-L-L-E-C-T. Collect. What we're doing is we're collecting the prayers, the hopes, the, the desires of the people of God, and we are presenting them to the Father. It's a fascinating thing. But that opening prayers, there actually should be a pause. You should go, let us pray. Pause. Everyone's you know, throwing out those prayers up to God the Father at that very moment. That's where you, you really kind of keep in mind. You should have prepared this before you get to Mass, right? Because you guys all prepared yourself before Mass, right? <laughs> But this is where you go, you know what, this is what I've been really struggling with this week. I really need a little bit of extra strength. I need a little bit of extra love. I need, I, don't pray for patience. You, there's lots of other graces that you can pray for. You never know what God's going to give you when you pray for patience. But pray for strength. Let's, look at those gifts of the Holy Spirit and pray for an outpouring of those. You know, piety, awe of the Lord, wisdom, fortitude, understanding, counsel, knowledge. Those gifts are what counter all the sinful things that we have. And so... If we need to, try it for those gifts of the Holy Spirit, first and foremost, and let those be what we're hoping for in that outpouring. And then we pray. That, um, that opening prayer, the prayer, this, the theme of the celebration is expressed, and the priest's words address the petition to God the Father, through Christ, and the Holy Spirit. It's always going to be Christ, to Father, with the Holy Spirit. Always. It's a fascinating thing, but that's kind of how this whole works. We pull the entire trinity together all the time. 
Liturgy of the Word. Okay. Um, the readings from sacred scripture, they form the main part of the section of the Mass. The homily, the profession of faith, the general intercessions, um, they expand and they complete it. The Liturgy of the Word is not a four Mass. It's actually, there are two liturgies that take place during the Mass. There's the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist. This is why it's acceptable to have two deacons. You have a deacon of the Word and a deacon of the Eucharist. And that's one of those beautiful things that if you have enough deacons, that would be a beautiful thing, wouldn't it? That you've got two different guys that are there to help and assist and to be a part of that. This is why we try to, I'm always going to promote the permanent diaconate, because I think it's such an important part of the church itself. I think it's an important piece to get people also engaged in their faith. Um, service is the main way to allow ourselves to grow in faith. And that's a great service that allows you to really dive in. Um, let's see. So it's not a four mass. Instead, it's an integral part of the liturgical celebration and truly affects the presence of the Lord amongst his people. God is speaking to his people. Christ is present to the faithful through his own word. And we need to be aware of that, that Christ is present in the Word. Is Christ's presence in the Word the same as the presence in the Eucharist? No, it's not. There is nothing better than Christ's presence in the Eucharist. You cannot get better than that. But we're not really comparing them. That's not really a fair thing to do anyways. We don't, we don't look at it in that way. We just we know that to be true, right? It's not something you go, uh-uh, you're wrong! But you, you know it to be a, a very real thing about our faith, okay? Let's see, we've got scripture readings themselves. Uh, the readings open up the riches of the Bible to the people. Proclamation of the readings is traditionally not a presidential function, but rather a ministerial function. This is where we get the laity to really engage in the Mass itself. This is, this is their participation within the liturgy. And anybody who was around before the Second Vatican Council knows that this is a big deal, right? This is an important thing, but this is something we also want to truly engage. Um, being a lecturer is not as easy as it looks. You know, I remember when I was a, a youth minister over at All Saints, uh, Father Brian Small, he'd be like, I want you to lecture tonight. And I'd be like, I don't want to lecture tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd make me do it. And, and I was horrible at it in the beginning. Like, so bad. Awful. And I, you know, I'd mumble words, and I just I wasn't good at it. Because um, I was intimidated being in front of the, uh, the people of God, you know. But clearly I got over it. Um, <laughs> it's important, though, that we, we make sure that we try to let those people be transformed through that ministry, though, that we want to engage as many people as we possibly can to be a part of that. And so we invite people that you wouldn't necessarily... You, you guys understand what I'm saying when I say that? This is where we pull the wallflowers out. This is how you get people engaged. Because it starts off being a lector. Then all of a sudden they want to be a university minister, and so you let them go through that training. That's a... That's a a court, it's, a, a, it's a privilege to, to be able to distribute Christ to his people, right? And so, but we start off, it starts off with lecturing, and then we, we move from there. <clears throat> okay. Um, thus, a reader should proclaim the non-gospel readings. The gospel should be proclaimed by the deacon. Now, if a deacon is not present at the Mass, that's okay, you got a priest. And a priest is still a deacon. Every priest was a deacon first. That's one of the steps. And we don't really call it a step because you don't stop ever being that. It's really, um, in the line of priesthood, it's, it's priesthood, diaconate. You take a detour off in service with the diaconate. And I always try to tell people that. It's not like a deacon is a baby priest. It is a role of service that is independent of being a priest. And it should be integral to the life of the priest himself but it is, is a very different ministry. Deacons are not baby priests, okay? Just, you need to know that. Um, okay. So the chant between the readings, the responsorial psalm. You know, psalms mean psalm. Um, during daily masses, I'm like, read it, because everybody doesn't have the gift of singing. They try to be crazy when they do something to it. And they're like, Father, you do know what that means. And I'm like, yeah, I went to seminary, thanks. <laughs> and the master's degrees, too. Um, but it, it's really about letting the people of God hear the words of those chants. And so it should be something that we, we do pause 
And it shouldn't be read from beginning to end without response. This is a dialogue that takes place going back and forth. It's an emulation in some ways of the, the prayer of the church, which is the Liturgy of the Hours. When it's done in choir, it goes back and forth. That's actually a beautiful thing if you actually, if everybody would actually fire on all cylinders and participate, you can really hear something taking place between the people in the choir and the people in the lector. And that's, that back and forth shows that relationship that's constantly taking place with God and us. And so we need to be aware that all movements in liturgy have intention. I, I apologize for the priests that don't take that seriously, but really everything should be incredibly intentional with the liturgy itself. You know, every bow, it matters. You know, every candle, it makes a difference. It's not just to make the altar pretty. There actually is significance, even based on the number of candles that take place. I can't, I can't uh, suggest the importance of this enough, but like, if you were teaching about our faith, you really should have a copy of the germ someplace at home. That's the general instruction of the Roman Missal. It is not the most riveting read you're ever going to have. You will not be sitting on the edge of your seat in bed. It might put you to sleep, so take it in small doses. But it's worth reflecting upon always, because it's important for us to be aware of what's happening at each moment. In every moment of the Mass, there is a lot that is actually happening. And so we need to be aware of that. It's called the GIRM, G-I-R-M, General Instruction of the Roman Missal. And you can get that on Amazon. Okay. This is the smallest print ever. I actually had a beautiful slideshow all set up for you guys, and my computer crashed at 1130 last night. And I don't think it's coming back from the dead. So. area of the cycle of the year, you're on, you're, well, you've got your first reading, you've got your, your psalm, you've got your second reading, you've got your gospel reading, right? These are universal throughout the church. Now, there are also additional feasts that are celebrated on each day, but a Sunday in ordinary time would take the place of whatever other feast that takes place. Because Sundays are technically holy days of obligation. I hate that word, but holy days of opportunity, we'll put it that way. And so, we look at... The reason that they're different, sometimes they get chanted, and so it's going to sound very different. You've got some flexibility with the psalm as long as it's a general theme. I really wish that we would sing the psalm that goes with that, but I'm not a director of liturgy. I'm just, you know, celebrating Mass. Um, they don't ask me about these things. But I, I think it's, it's important to be familiar with and, and realize that there actually is only one specific reading. Just some parishes take some liturgies with that. The Eucharist Report. There are... exercising his diaconal role. And then the homily happens. What's the difference between a homily and a sermon? Anybody? The homily reflects on the readings. Yeah, exactly. A homily is what we're supposed to be doing every week. Priests that go off and deacons that go off and they preach about something that has nothing to do with the readings, I don't know what that brings to the table personally. Um, we're supposed to be deepening the relationship that the people have with their God. And so it really should be relevant to what has nourished us by way of the word, right? <clears throat> and so, I mean, I'm not being critical of the priests who go off the reservation. Some gospels are more challenging to preach about than others, but that's why we've got all those other readings. Because nobody says that you have to preach on the gospel itself. You can do some amazing stuff with Paul's writings as well, if that's what you want to do. But some guys take those liberties. May God bless them. <coughs> I, I guess that's what they felt that they needed to do. But really, the homily itself should guide us into the celebration of, of the Eucharist itself and should be based on the Word. And so that's that's an important distinction between the two. I'm not saying they're doing it wrong. I'm not saying if they give a sermon and everything else was done perfectly, that the Mass is illicit. Not at all. Actually, the words of the homily themselves have no bearings on how illicit or valid the Mass may be. Um, because it's not technically a prayer. It's a pause. 
that takes place during the liturgy itself. It is an element of the liturgy. You should always have a homily, particularly on a Sunday, but you don't have to necessarily. Um, and I, I think that's an important distinction that we can make. Palm Sunday is a great example of that. How much homily do you need after hearing the, you know, the passion of our Lord? You know, there's only so much that can be said after those words are heard. And so that's where you would really just say, you know, this is where we, we pause to reflect upon the love that our God has for us. Profession of faith, the creed itself, this is when we stand and we truly profess it. I want us to be aware of the fact that when we are praying, like, the glory itself, the glory is usually sung, right? It is a prayer. We want to encourage the people of God to sing along. That's an important thing. That's why, just from a personal standpoint, I try to get away from the, the, the beautiful, the Gregorian drawn-out chants of the Gloria, only because I want higher participation amongst the people. And there's a very big difference between some of the folksy Glorias that take place and Gregorian chant. Gregorian chant is like six steps away from that. And so we want to take one step at a time in that progression of educating the faithful about liturgical music. And so, baby steps. Do the, the responses, perhaps, with that Gregorian at first. That, that might be a, an incremental change in educating the community. Um, but really, that's not a salvation issue. You know, Just because something's not Latin and lace doesn't mean it's not Catholic. And we need to be very aware of that at all points in time. That swath of orthodoxy is far wider than we think it is. Um, you know, drums. You know, in most Eurocentric parishes, you hear about drums, and people are like, whoa. If you were in Africa and you didn't hear drums, somebody would be like, the mass was missing something. <laughs> you know, and so we need to be aware of the fact that where we are, the church flourished from the north of Africa. Early celebrations of the liturgy would have had far more drums and percussion than it would have had organs. And realize, let's Google when the organ was created. It was not at the time of Christ. Um, and so we need to be aware of that as well. Perspective is really important. Don't get me wrong, I'm also somebody who chants the Mass from time to time. But there's time and place for all of those things. And so what the goal is to bring people into Christ first and foremost. Profession of faith, we want to get people engaged in that. Um, and this is why I don't want the priest to be up there just mumbling. Like, and it's easy to do that because he just preached. He's probably tired, you know, and so there's that moment. It's actually really appropriate. I'm particularly guilty of this. It's smart to go and just sit down for a second. Catch your breath. Let that sacred silence take place. Silence is only a bad thing on the radio. It's not bad during Mass. And so that ability to just stop, it's important. And educating everybody, all ages, about sacred silence and how important it is. You know, engage in prayer where we, we you know, you pause after you finish those words. Before you say amen, teach everybody you can that silence is okay because it's just learning to be comfortable and you guys know this like growing in a relationship there comes that point where you're sitting at breakfast with somebody and you're like i'm okay not talking to you and they're like yeah i'm okay not talking to you <laughs> that means you're in good relationship that's a beautiful thing we need to be comfortable with that sitting in the presence of our god and not needing to always say something and the truth is he's god he already knows what's in your mind and in your heart so like put just spewing words at him then we do the profession of faith, and then we go into the general intercessions, the prayers of the faithful. This is where we just, we kind of gather it all together. These can go so many different ways, and I'm not going to tell you how to pray in that regard, but this is the time for that to take place. There are four major things that we should be praying for. We want to pray for the Pope. We want to pray for our parish community local. We want to pray for our country or community that's outside of the church itself. We want to pray for the sick. We want to pray for the dead. Those are the major things, right? Everything else you just kind of toss in there. So whatever the needs are based on what's going on, whatever it is that we need to focus on, the things that we should bring to the attention, not necessarily the things that get posted in the news, but that are important to our lives. That's the stuff that we want to form our hearts with, and that's very, very important. Once we've done that, uh, the prayers of the faithful or those general intercessions, that's the conclusion of the Liturgy of the Word, and we go into the Liturgy of the Eucharist. This is where the presentation of the gifts takes place. Now, we live in the United States, and so we just get this, you know, bread and wine, water, come down, and it depends on what parish you're at, what that looks like, what kind of celebration that looks like. If you've ever spent any time in other cultures, this would be a very 
appropriate time where maybe someone would bring some livestock up or something of that nature. I've actually seen masses in Africa where chickens were brought forward. Um, it was a beautiful gift for the parish and they were going to be provided as a meal at a later point in time. Um, and we see that and we're like, what's the chaos? It's crazy. Well, no, these are the offerings of the people. It's not just bread and wine. It's, it's what keeps the community alive. And so we need to be aware of that. It, it's, this can't be such a robotic thing. It needs to be a living thing. We are community, and we need to live that way. And the general instruction gives some, some good stuff on that. <clears throat> so first, the altar is prepared. There is the corporal that goes down. Then there's the purificator. There's the missal. There is a chalice. These are the essential things. Book stand, optional. Pillow, optional. Uh, Paul, optional. You know, um, words eluding me. The card. Patent, thank you. Well, there's the patent, and then there's the, what's the thing that goes with the chalice? Nobody's coming up with this one right now. <laughs> Clearly, optional. Anyway. <laughs> know what I'm talking about, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Flat it's the flat cardboard thing that keeps on. That's actually its main purpose. And when you need one most, you never have one. Um, but it's, it's, it's not an essential piece. These are the essential parts. Because we want to make sure that we've got uh, vessels that are precious metals. Now, if you live in a place where precious metals aren't available, something that's held in such a high regard as a precious metal, but that's not porous. And so this may be I don't know. I live in the United States. We have an abundance of everything. So <laughs> I apologize for my, uh, my American mind, but that's the reality of it. And so the gifts are then brought forward. And they're accepted by the priest or the deacon. That comes straight from the missile itself. And so the deacon is actually the one who prepares the altar. He's, you know, this is one of the great things. My father's a permanent deacon. I'm like, who's at the table? Um, <laughs> and he does. He's obedient. It's amazing. But it, it's actually, it, it's a great thing because that's that moment where we're getting everything ready to go. You know, and that's a, actually a, a really proper moment for the priest to kind of be sitting back for a second while the, the altar is getting prepared before the gifts are gathered. Pray. I mean, that's when I pray a lot myself. Now, this is also when the collections are going on, and so that's a hard thing for you guys to pray. But it's a very good moment for you guys to stop and pray. Obviously, you're going to throw whatever it is that you need to into the basket. That's cool. Do it. Um, but... If you do online giving, you don't have to do that. You can actually just close your eyes and pass the basket and game <laughs> on. Good time to pray, because it's it's reflecting upon what you just heard, and it's also looking forward to what I'm hoping for this week. This is a good moment to stop. It's a good moment to reflect. Because one thing is not yet done, but something has just finished, and so we keep going. So, Eucharistic prayer takes place. The center and summit of the entire celebration itself. There are uh, eight chief elements that we give the Eucharistic prayer. Thanksgiving, especially expressed in the preface. The acclamation, which is the sanctus, holy, holy, holy. There is the epiclesis, that's the calling of the Holy Spirit. There is the institution narrative, take this all of you and eat of it. Um, <clears throat> consecration itself, anamnesis, and then there's the offering intercession and the final doxology through him with him. So we go through those various moments. That is the Eucharistic prayer itself, right? You've got your four options there. There's also another one for reconciliation. There's also Marian Eucharistic prayers. There are so many options. Um, but these are the ones, it wasn't until the Second Vatican Council that we actually got options. And so that was kind of a great gift that came from the church. A, you got options. B, you can do them in your own language. Cool, okay. Um, there's the following along. Here's one of the hard things when you're in a, in a smaller area. In a big church, not a big deal. But even when I'm celebrating with another priest, it's actually really hard when you hear somebody whispering the words over you when you're the one who's the celebrant. Um, and I'm not saying don't do that, but I'm saying if you feel some overwhelming desire to read along, please don't do it loudly. Do it in your heart. Um, because really the only person, and I'm not being clerical, but the only person who was ordained to do this would be the priest who's up there praying that. And so it really, those are the prayers of the priest. The priest is standing there in persona Christi, you know, and don't give me a hard time if, if you're for, focusing on something else for ordination. I am so low on the totem pole, I have no control over that. I just know what God called me to do, and that's what I do. 
And so that prayer really should come from the priest. And it really should be a moment where he's praying. Um, we're talking about getting lost, though. Maybe more kind of goes into, he'll start off in Eucharistic prayer one or two. And he gets about a third of the way into it, and then it's like, I don't know where he's coming up the rest of it. it it's, I, I don't know. I don't know do that. I mean, he's actually reading it out of the Is it book. the one with all the saints' names? No. No. Um, it's I mean, it's easy to lose your place in the, in the Roman canon. I, I'll just say that. But he really shouldn't. That shouldn't be happening. Yeah, I Is mean, understand you, you've got colleagues of the day, no. you've got various... Uh, things that you need to, to take care of because it's a special Sunday sure. or something yeah. like that. But eventually, the Eucharistic prayer ought to be a Eucharistic prayer. I, I mean, I, I look at the forum and try to find it. So I could not tell you because I wasn't there. But okay. there, there are a couple other options. Um, you know, the main thing, there are lots of different prefaces. And the priest can pray whatever preface he wants, pending it's appropriate. But, yeah. And even if it's not appropriate, technically, he can still do that. The only words that actually have to be verbatim for a valid mass, this is a technical thing, and I am not suggesting that anyone does this, and I'm not saying this. The only words that are necessary for a valid mass are the words of institution. Right? So if he says some other words from some other prayer, as long as the words of institution were there, technically, you've got Jesus. Right? Um, so don't worry about the validity. But even then, let's say he goes back and he does the last edition of the Missal before, you know, and he, and he uses those words of opposed to the most modern and the most recent revision. Your job, your goal was to be at Mass. You fulfilled your obligation. Now, are you getting Jesus? Technically, I would actually say no. Uh, but your desire was to receive Jesus, and so you're fulfilled in that obligation. And there is grace in that, because your will and God's will cooperate. Okay? Um, that's a technicality, and I wouldn't want to, I don't like to, to focus on the exception. I, I prefer to focus on the rule, but at least for peace of mind, does that help? Yeah, okay. All right. <clears throat> so we've got the Eucharistic prayer itself. Now, each of these elements are, are really important. We need to be aware of the fact that um, the relational aspect. Pay attention to those words of the preface. Like, really pay attention. The prefaces are beautiful. Um, each one of them. There are, I think there are four, no, there are five options for Sundays of Mary time, I think. Um, but like, take a second and try to look at those at some point. Those are beautiful prayers. There's a preface specific to Eucharistic Prayer 2 that's just for Eucharistic Prayer 2. I can actually use that for another, um, with another Eucharistic Prayer. So I can start with the preface from 2 and I can actually do Eucharistic Prayer 3. That's okay. You can't mix and match, you know? It, it's, it's what are you trying to do to guide people in that relationship? And so as long as I take something from Part A, something from Part B, something from Part C, then obviously I'm going to be in a good place. C would be everything that takes place after the doxology. And so that's where we go into the Our Father. Okay. Man, an hour's not enough time. Here we go. So when we look at the Our Father itself, it's important for us to be aware of the, the way that the prayer is divided by. This is the beauty of this prayer itself, okay? So <clears throat> for the first three parts, Our Father, who art in heaven, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That statement itself going halfway through, these are petitions that are, are kind of guiding us in the glory of God himself. It's acknowledging who God is first and foremost. <clears throat> now, this is the, the cool thing about that. Our Father, that idea of our, it guides us together in community. Like, this is one of those moments, this is one of those salvation issues that aren't salvation issues that get debated all the time. Do I hold hands? Do I not hold hands? I'm not talking about the priest. The priest is never supposed to hold hands. I don't have to debate on that one. But as far as the people in Jesus, like, what, do I need to hold hands? Do I not need to hold hands? It doesn't matter. Where is your prayer directed? It's to God. Okay? Now, this is the potential danger of holding hands when we're waiting for those last words and to get that squeeze of hands for the kingdom of the power and glory are yours now and forever. Are you focused on squeezing hands? Are you focused on praying to God? This is, this is why, what I want us to be aware of. So, did you sin by holding hands? Of course not. And that's not an issue. 
But we need to be aware of where is my prayer directed always. That's such an important thing without in, in every element of the Mass itself. Am I praying the prayer to God? Or am I praying the prayer for me? <coughs> am I praying the prayer because I really want to give glory? Or am I praying this because I like showing up? You know, that's really what it comes down to. And so when we look at, at Matthew 6, when he's talking about how not to pray, we need to be aware of that. It's a really important thing. Matthew 6 is, is giving the warnings of prayer. Don't just babble, you know, like the pagans. Don't just talk at God. Be very deliberate. You know, that's why the Sanctus has three times it's showing the great gravity of, of that. You don't just say something to say it. This is before 140 characters. This is before Twitter, right? We didn't just spew every opinion that we ever had. So for one to say something, it should have profound gravity. And so when we pray, particularly addressing for God, we need to be very intentional. What am I doing? So when we look at the Our Father, the first word is saying are, meaning not only am I a child, I'm an adopted son or daughter of God the Father, but also that I am brothers and sisters with every person that is in this room. And that we all are united through those waters of baptism together. And we need to be aware of the fact that we come and enter into that so that we can be closer with each other. The heralds back to that comment that I made about the Trappist in the very beginning. We enter into the church so that we can be closer. Not to get away from everyone, but rather to grow in relationship. Those second three parts um, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Give us this Lord, give us Lord our daily bread. That that translation that actually comes from the Greek is a, it's a fascinating word that you cannot find anywhere else in Greek text. And it talks about this super substantial bread. In fact, when Jerome did the translation in the Latin. It actually says super substantial bread. Now, obviously, he wrote it in Latin, so it doesn't say super. You know, you're right. <laughs> Meaning that it's something that's so different, something so special, something particular. It's a reference to the Eucharist itself, that bread of life that gives us life. But it's also recognizing that that's what we need. And it's the bread that is to come. It's, it's something that is going to happen. And so we are hoping for what is to come. Once again, that element of hope is present. Um, we also talk about that need for reconciliation and the relationships in our lives, where we forgive those who trespass against us, but we need to be forgiven as well. And through that, through that reconciling act, we grow together. Um, and so just through that one prayer, that one prayer within a prayer, we become so much more aware of the relationship that we have. We've identified the very nature of God, that he is in heaven, not here with us, but in heaven, that he is separate from us, but that we need him and that we belong with him. And so we need to be ever so aware of that, that very nature of the presence of God and that relationship that we have with God. Now, we can't change God, you know, and that's such an important thing in prayer itself. You can't change him. You're hoping that he changes you. And that's why we engage in prayer itself. So let's think of all these different prayers that we've had within the Mass itself. Then what we do is we offer each other the sign of peace. And it's a symbolic. This isn't where we run around the church and go, I love all of you. <laughs> this is where you turn to the person on your left, you turn to the person on your right, and you let them know that you desire for the peace of Christ to be with them. This is where we are symbolically bearing the hatchet with every person that takes us off all week long. You're letting it go. Not to pick it back up when we walk out those doors, but you are done with the conflict. That you desire the peace of Christ, not only yourself, but for them. That's why we offer the sign of peace. It's not about loving everybody. It's about bearing the hatchet. It's about making amends. And why do we make amends then? Because what's happening next? <coughs> we receive our Lord and Savior. We are fulfilled and nourished by our God. And what a profound gift that is. And so you want nothing to be coming before your God. You want him to be what you are receiving. And so we say, peace be with you. We acknowledge the Lamb of God and behold him who takes away the sins of the world. It's a powerful moment. 
And this isn't a moment for you to get back to your seat because you've been hugging everybody all about the church. You should be there already. Ready to go. Ready to behold the Lamb of God. And then it happens. And then we all go forward. We move towards that altar to receive Christ. We all come in one direction. We are all part of the flock moving together. And we receive our God. We are nourished by the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the Lord. And then we take time to go back. We want to teach our kids um, that we teach that this is a profound moment of prayer. And kids watch every single thing that we do. But it's not just the kids. We've got a lot of uh, non-Catholic brothers and sisters that come to our masses. And they are watching what you do. And they are watching what all of us are doing. And so if you're checking out what everybody's wearing during the communion line, well, then they think that we're more interested in fashion than we are in salvation. So be mindful in that area. Engage in that. And the reason people close their eyes in prayer isn't because they're super holy. It's because they have ADD. They're closing their eyes to block out the distractions so that it's just you and God. Because in that moment, you're a human tabernacle. The Lord is within you. He's been within you since your baptism. But now you are being nourished by his body, blood, soul, and divinity. Embrace that moment. It's going to be the best part of your week. That very moment. Not if you've got little kids, because they're probably hanging out. <laughs> At some point in your life, you will regain that peace. It will be a beautiful moment for you again. The concluding rite that takes place, this is such an important thing. I want to see ever mind of this. What makes us Catholic is what happens from the time that we are dismissed until the time that we walk back in. We are so focused and so single-mindedly aware of the fact that we have the true presence of the Eucharist, but that's meaningless if we are not living out our faith from the time that we are dismissed to go in the peace of Christ until the moment that we come back to bless ourselves and be remain mindful of that. We need to live out of life as Christians, and we need to be willing to teach our brothers and sisters this. You know, to be a Christian doesn't mean we accuse everybody of being sinners. You love them in spite of the fact that they're sinners. And to truly be an apostle means that when you see someone in the ditch, you're willing to crawl down in there with them and help them. And so, my brothers and sisters, I hope that this was a, a special moment uh, that kind of gives us just a little bit deeper understanding of the Mass itself, but also how deliberate we need to be within that. And I pray that uh, this was a, a good experience for all of y'all, and I thank you for